Hi, everyone. We hope you had a great holiday weekend. Welcome back to this Friday Science Roundup. This week's podcast is called How to Give an Animal Autism. But don't be fooled by that title. I know it's provocative, but it was somewhat sarcastic. Just to be clear, you can't give an animal autism. Animals are not people, and they cannot have an autism diagnosis. However, I had noticed that on these podcasts, we really haven't talked about them. The past two weeks while we were gone, two new studies came out using different animal models of a mutation of a gene called norexin. One was a mouse model, one was a rat model, but they both had the same mutation. If you've never heard the word norexin before, norexin is one of many autism susceptibility genes. Unlike some of the others, the signals on this are pretty strong and consistent, and they've been replicated. The protein produced by this gene helps glue brain cells together so that they can communicate. It's actually interesting how it works. One part of the protein interacts with a actually different protein called neuroligin. Norexin and neuroligin shake hands across the two different cells, which results in the connection of the two neurons and the, and the solidification of connections between the two neurons. Neuroligin is also another autism candidate gene. So you have both neuroligin and norexin being autism candidate genes using gene studies. So it really is no surprising that they're involved, this whole interaction is involved with autism. An interesting side note about norexins, which I found on Wikipedia, they're what is targeted by the toxin in black widow spider venom. Given how important this gene is in autism, more studies should be done to see if it causes autism. Right now, we really don't know. The only way we can find out is through animal studies. So this is great. Two studies were published in the past two weeks. In the first study published in Nature, mice with the norexin 2 mutation showed decreased social behaviors like, say, smelling another mouse and increased anxiety. The mice were not affected in some memory or motor behaviors. However, in a rat model, the memory tasks were impaired, pretty impaired. They didn't look at any social behaviors, but I think that there are two interesting things about this. One is that even though the results were a little bit different, it's just important, it's just as important to know what behaviors are not associated with autism to show what's specific and what is not. It's also incredibly rare to have a knockout rat model. They are smarter, believe it or not, and they're able to do more complex tasks. So you're more likely to see differences on these complex tasks. If it's something that a mouse cannot do or scientists cannot study in mice, but rats can do it, then that's why there's a difference. So how do you make a norexin knockout? That's a good question. It's not easy. That's why scientists have already developed them and are encouraged to share them, especially to companies who can breed them and distribute them more. There is a company called Sage Labs that's making knockout rats for more extensive studies so that lots of different research projects can study them. The project is being co-sponsored by Autism Speaks. These animals are actually the first step in developing drug targets. A few years ago, a study was published that looked at different ways, not just different drugs in which neural ligand could be changed. So this included environmental enrichment, which is actually the very best model of early intervention. So animal models don't just get used to look at drug targets. These methods need to be identified and tested in animal models first to see if the protein expression can be changed and whether or not those changes result in improvements in functioning. But it's also to remember, again, that these are mice and rats. We shouldn't call them autistic. There are features of autism that cannot be recreated in animals so far that we know of. So on to the next study. It was a study that looked at a large genetic database to try and isolate different types of autism depending on the different group of genes involved. I know I harp a lot about subtypes, but I think that they're really important, so you're going to hear about them over and over again. In the past, scientists have grouped people with autism based on their phenotype, like, say, language ability or cognitive ability. In this approach, the authors grouped them by their genotype. So what type of genes are affected, and do people with different genes group into different categories? So first they took the people that had mutations or copy number variations in genes with, that were specific to autism or intellectual disability. Then they took the people that had differentially brain-expressed mutations. 
So these are genes that are involved with specific differential expression in the brain and the central nervous system as compared to other body tissues. So a gene that is only expressed in the brain compared to the liver or is expressed um, really, really high in the brain but not in the kidney. So there was some overlap, but they were able to generally group them into these two categories. What they found was pretty interesting. They found that the group that had the mutations in the autism and intellectual disability group, their, their, the deficits they showed were mostly around communication and language function. Those that were grouped with the genes in the DBE or the differentially brain expressed, they had some disabilities, but they were more broad. They really had some issues in adaptive function. So they concluded that those genes were more involved in having a broader impact on neurodevelopmental disorders rather than one specific feature of ASD, suggesting a more generalized role. There was also differences in people that had duplications, so where a gene sequence is repeated, versus deletions, where the gene sequence is completely missing. In fact, people with these deletions had more severe autism symptoms. So I know this is complicated, and the statistical analysis was um, even confusing to me. So I wanted to get to the bottom line. What does this all mean? It's a great question. This is one of the first studies to tie different types of genes together with different types of mutation to different types of autism. In the future, scientists are really going to have to carefully sort out the different genes, the different environmental factors, as well as the way autism is presented. For example, clinicians in the community may need to start collecting the same measures in the same way. Combining all these approaches is what's going to lead us to this different subgroups of autism tied to different genetics, which will lead to more specific treatments. That's it, everybody. If you enjoy these webcasts, please consider donating to the Autism Science Foundation. You can go to recipe 4 the number 4 hopeorg to see how one family that has affected twins with autism is supporting ASF to fund critically important research. Please consider making a donation to ASF beyond just Giving Tuesday. Every dollar counts. Thanks for listening and have a great week. Talk to you next Friday.